All right, we are recording. So I, I just, I, I've been working on uh, sort of a, a, a basic task of really trying to understand in detail how, uh, how um, a metric space like grid cells work and how they're implemented in the cortex, specifically like the real anatomy of it. How would, how would you create these things? And it's, it's um, I haven't been able to focus as much time on preparing anything about it, but I think I've made some interesting observations. So I just thought today I would, I'm frustrated I've been you know, working on the book so much, I haven't really been able to present this material. So what I thought I would do today is very briefly just explain what I'm working on and not my, my results. So um, this is just a sort of a toe in the water saying, here's the thing I'm working on. Um, and if, if that's of interest, maybe someone can chat with me later, but uh, hopefully in a, after the, a couple of weeks when the, when the book is out, I'll be able to put together, I've, I've been writing this up and I'm not gonna go through my write up yet. So in that context, um, just so like, here's what I'm working on when I'm not writing the book. Uh, so I showed this figure last time. Um, this was a, a nice illustration of, of how the basic idea, how a grid cell is created using the oscillatory inference model. So hopefully everyone will remember this, um, which the basic idea is you need uh, two oscillators. You need a baseline oscillator, which is in the red. You, that's your theta, your baseline theta. You need another oscillator, which is theta plus a small delta. The delta is determined by the motion of the animal, or in the case of the cortex, the motion of the sensor, the motion, whatever is moving um, in a particular direction. So the faster it's moving in a particular direction, the, 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 the higher the frequency of the green oscillator. But there's only a small difference between them. And so they run in and out of phase, um, which you can see in the, this purple line. And so if, if a rat was on a, if this was a grid cell uh, or a, you know, on a one dimensional track that this cell would fire on and off and would fire in, at various points in time, like here and here and here as a rat moves along the track. So that's the basic idea behind how um, almost all, all the oscillatory interference models work on this basic idea. But this is only one cell that does not map the entire array. It doesn't, talk about 2D, it does a whole bunch of questions that go on top of it. But this uh, model also is highly recommended because it illustrates the uh, precession idea where a cell fires later as it's, appro uh, as it's approaching its peak and then fires uh, earlier in, in the theta cycle as it proceeds from it. So uh, the next thing you wanna do is you, if you wanna make a, um, if you want to get a set of cells that fire in sequence, like a grid cell module, like a, a 1D grid cell module, then you need a set of oscillators, um, um, uh, each at a different, uh, so you, instead of having one green guy, you'd have to have multiple green guys here, each one at a different phase. And, and so then if you did that, you'd have one cell firing here, and another cell firing here, and another cell firing here, and another cell firing here. And so this has been postulated as a, uh, a ring attractor. So I took this picture from um, the paper we reviewed a while back, the hybrid model. Um, this was in the Bush and Burgess hybrid, hybrid model paper. I, I, unfortunately, this is, I find this a confusing drawing, but um, it, it does illustrate the issue there. Um, here they're proposing there's multiple, this is a ring oscillator here. So these, all these cells are firing at the same frequency, but they're slightly in and out of phase. So as a, they go, the, fate, the peak of their firing travels in a circle like this, but they're all at a voltage controlled um, um, frequency depending on the movement in a particular direction. So if I just had these cells here, these would, um, these would, whoops, sorry about that. These cells here, um, if I looked at when they peak relative to the, to the base theta, these would implement a 1D grid cell module in this direction of movement. And these would represent another 1D grid cell module in this direction of movement and so on. So these are a bunch of 1D grid cell modules if you compare these peak these cells with the base theta. And then if you wanted to get a two-dimensional grid cell, that would be this row of cells here, you have to look at more than one of these um, 1D modules. In fact, as, as when Florian here, we talked about how you only need two of these really to get a, a, 2D, a 2D tessellation. Um, um, but if you want a really nice one, then you, you should get a bunch of them. So here they're showing uh, six of them at, at 60 degree uh, angles. And so if you had a nice perfect thing like this, this cell, it was looking at these grid, these, these are like 1D grid cell modules. And, if you, and then this cell here would be basically saying, oh, I'm gonna, I'm, I would create a 2D grid cell. That's one 2D grid cell. 
So the question I've been asking in, in this in this in that one in that model are they all going at the same frequency? No, no, they would all be going at different frequencies based on the movement in this particular direction. So every cell has sort of like a base theta, and then the theta increases a little bit depending on how fast you're moving in this particular direction. So then the frequency would if the, if the animal was only it was moving very rapidly in this direction, then the, the this would be the the fastest frequency. This one would be increased a little bit because it's moving a little bit. Imagine it's going from left to right. Well, in this yeah. case, it would be just a little bit incremented. Here, it's not clear what would happen here because these, these oscillations don't slow down. Um, they, only go, they only go faster. Uh, we can talk about that. But anyway, either, either this one's discounted or it runs at theta, base theta in this case. So, uh, but there are the, 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 the ones where you have a positive movement in this direction, they would be running faster than the other ones. So, so these are so this is the model where you have a bunch of 1D grid sub modules, but they're all at different angles. Yeah, sense. yeah, yeah. It, it, again, I find this figure um, it's com it's conflating a bunch or com combining a bunch of things at once, which made it difficult for me to understand it initially, and so it's not ideal for me. But but basically, if these were cells, and they're uh, uh, and and then you could look at uh, and these cells are all peaking at, uh, within one theta cycle, um, and you compared it to a base theta, which is not shown in this picture, then uh, one of these cells in a ring would be in phase at any point in time and, and over and over again, and then it would slowly shift to the next one and slowly shift to the next one. So these are, if I, if I, had, if I had a cell, it's not really showing, if I had a cell that basically combined this red dot plus a theta, then, um, that cell would be a, a one-day grid cell, and then this would be a one-day grid cell module. Uh, they're skipping right ahead to combining them into a two-day grid cell module. I have a question. So this assumes that uh, all uh, these things at uh, slightly different phases are all arriving simultaneously. So you're depending upon the phase differences simply being a temporal difference. But it could also be a spatial difference if they're delayed due to distance. That could also yeah. Although theta is pretty slow, right? I mean, you say let's say it's eight hertz. It's 120 milliseconds per. Uh, right, but it's not it, necessarily propagation time. If there's you know, if there's for some reason there is some intermediary that basically yeah, is fire and delay of fire. Yeah, I think that that's right. I, I'm I don't think that's likely going to turn out to be the case, Kevin. But it's possible. Um, um, I, I, I don't think, I don't think these models don't, don't account for any kind of intermediary or propagation delay or anything like that. Um, and I'm, I'm not thinking about that either. I think this is all local enough and it's just slow enough. Um, uh, unless we, unless we're going to insert extra intermediary cells in it for some reason, um, we, I don't think we should, I'm not thinking about that, okay. but you know, it's, it's possible. I mean, the so, reason I mention is is that the so the timing of these things to all kind of you know maintain a phase with respect to each other is a difficult ask. But if there is a physical spatial reason for the phase, well, oh, that's okay, I mean. yes, actually, I agree with you. I mean, what the question I'm going to ask is where are the ring attractors in a carnival cup? Okay, so that's the question I'm getting at, and so um, there has to be a physical mechanism to make cells do this, right? So if that's what you're saying, I'm with you. Right, I mean, in essence, yeah. The, these as these models are proposed, I don't believe they try to map this onto the biology in any sense. They're just saying this is a theoretical model, and I'm trying to map it onto the biology, and then you get this physical structure that has to implement this. That is, it's, if that's what you're asking, then you're absolutely right. That's that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, I've I've come to believe that this basic model of ring attractors is correct, and um, there's a lot of things with say that this is probably the right 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 thing but how does this actually implement in the neurons now you have to look at the physical structure of the cortex and say well, where would this be um the first thing i want to point out about that is i don't think there are a bunch of cells in a ring the cortex doesn't look like that and some very simple animals uh you know there are some sort of you know insects and so on there's some ring like cell structures but nothing like this in the cortex. My first assumption that these are not in a ring, that they're actually a linear uh, array of cells and that the phase pro progression is moving along in a linear direction. So that's what I wrote down here. Ring attractors are most likely linear arrays, not rings. That's the first thing 
uh, it just, that seems if there's if there's going to be ring attractors, they don't have to be rings. They can be just a line of cells that that are marching in um, that that are slightly delayed in their peak. Um, that would that would map to the idea of waves moving across. Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. Well, so let's get down to the next thing. Where so then I asked myself, okay, I'm going with this idea. These ring attractors. This makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I mentioned earlier how you know mini columns look like they're uh, voltage um, modulated um, movement vectors and so on. So I got all the right inf information there. So where are these? And I basically want to say I think I've been pursuing two basic ideas. Unfortunately. Almost all the knowledge we have about the detailed structure of the cortex, is, most of the knowledge, or the most detailed knowledge, is in V1. And so, we, and so the question we have to ask is, is V1 typical of other cortical areas or not? So one of the things that V1 has is it has these, we know it has these orientation um, preferences. And we used to say they're orientation columns, but that's not really true. They're orientation slabs. And, and so if you move in one direction, you see the cells respond to uh, orientations uh, that are changing, but if you move in the other direction, uh, they're basically um, uh, it's a, the common orientation. And uh, this it's often drawn like this, but we know that these these things are kind of messy. They kind of come to these points of the uh, pinwheels and so on. But but this is a, this is a very well established idea that you have uh, in in one if you move your probe across in one direction in the column, you'll find changing orientations, which to me are changing uh, movement vectors. They're saying different, different directions this thing can be moving. And then in this direction, you have um, a commonality. Um, and it really, it, it's, it's not clear what's going on in this direction. And of course, there are many columns throughout this. I'll get to that in a second. So one idea I've, I've been pursuing, um, and this is not the one I'm currently favoring, but it's just I put it in there for completeness. The sim one simple idea is that the ring could be a set of cells in a layer in a mini column. So like you could say, like take layer three, there may be 10, 15 cells in that layer. Uh, and, the, and the progression of the phase could be a physically, physically moving from one end down vertically across that layer. So the cells are operating in, uh, so this, all the cells in this mini column are basically representing the same movement vector. And then if I could get the cells to fire at slightly different phases, um, then, and as long as it, there's enough cells here to cover the whole, um, you know, uh, a whole, a whole cycle, then uh, you would have a ring attractor. Um, so that was one idea. And it was like, oh, that's really convenient because look, here's a mini column. I've been arguing the mini column is a, is a movement vector. And uh, I have just a bunch of cells in that and they can just progress like this. And it's not every cell in the mini column, oops, sorry. It's just, a, it's just a, a, you know, like one layer of cells. And that was really nice. And this would result in many 1D grid cell modules. Essentially the cells, every mini column would be a 1D grid cell module. Uh, and there's a lot of advantages of having a lot of mod make grid cell modules, makes very high, high dimensional spaces. The other, the other opportunity I pursued, and this one I mentioned when Florian was here, is that you, uh, your, your ring is not vertical, but your ring movement is, is across the, um, uh, the orientation slab. So in this case, each mini column is in essence a, a phase shifted um, element of the ring. Um, and so each, each slab is, then each slab becomes a ring attractor. Uh, and so you have a, a progression of phase moving in one direction like this. Um, this, this seems a really odd idea, like, like well, how's that going to happen? And why would it happen that way? And, and so on. Um, yeah, that means I'm, it's like, well, in one direction, I get changing phase and the other, in the other direction, I get changing, or, you know, um, orientation or changing uh, movement vectors, what's going to force that to happen. Um, but I've come to actually like this idea a lot. I think it's, there's some real things, <laughs> and I'm not going to go through why at the moment. Um, but one thing you do is you give up a lot of, um, you, you end up with many fewer um, uh, grid cell, uh, 1D grid cell modules, uh, but you end up with now you have the idea, possibility of the, using the pyramidal cells in each in, in each thing here, then provide a sort of temporal memory-like context. So now I could select, you know, if there's 10 cells in layer three or layer five, for example, um, I could selectively activate one or two, or two to basically pick, pick um, at a context layer, like in the same way the temporal memory works. So this turns out, I, this, I, I, cringed, I cringed at first thinking this could really be true because it's a very complicated system. Um, uh, of which there's very little evidence for. 
Um, but um, it's starting to look pretty good, actually. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm trying to walk way through the, the different issues there uh, associated with it. But I think if, if the basic idea is that, well, we know there's going to be grid cells. Um, I'm really convinced that the, 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 the oscillatory inter interference model is the way to go. That leads to you, essentially someplace you have to have 1D sort of um, um, uh, grid cell modules, which can be converted into 2D grid cell modules. You need ring oscillators to do that. Where are the ring oscillators? There's only so many places you can have ring oscillators. One way is you can do it vertically. The other way is you can do it, you know, laterally. Um, and um, you know, assuming that there aren't actually rings anywhere in the, in the cortex. And then, um, then you can sort of tease apart the different attributes, what happens when you do it one way versus the other way. Um, and I have a lot of notes on this, but I, it, I haven't been able to structure it yet. So that's the basic idea of what I'm working on right now. I haven't reached a conclusion, but right now this one looks uh, promising. The, the, the only downside to this method, um, and, and by the way, this, this can even lead to the two-dimensional grid cell modules, um, a two-dimensional um, array like we saw in the tank paper, because if you assume that mini columns inhibit a surrounding set of mini columns, you end up with a, a set of cells that are active in here spaced apart that look like, uh, look like the grid cells that we saw in the tank paper. Um, anyway, that's all I want to say about this. Um, uh, I want to get back to it, and I won't be, probably won't be able to really get serious about it for about two weeks. Um, then I'll do it. But I just thought I'd mention what I'm working on. And um, it's kind of fun to think about. One of the things that, that... I think we can solve this problem, by the way. I, I think we can do this complete mapping. Uh, go ahead. One of the things that you're, you're doing here is the previous model assumed like there was like a, uh, uh, one of the papers assumed like there's a, 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 a synchronous clock frequency, like you do a lot of, you know, chips right now. But there's an alternative form of logic, which is self-timed, where it basically things propagate when they're ready to go and activate the next thing. So you basically inherently have these wave fronts that move outwards. Uh, mm. And so there's, the, there's a, the, the advantage of that is then you don't have to do, uh, you don't have to make sure your clock propagates to all parts of the chip simultaneously within a certain yeah. scheme. Yes. It just locally w walks its way through. Yeah, I, although here, we, I think it's a bit of a hybrid here because remember that these models all rely on the idea that there's a base theta frequency and, well, and, and that is being distributed to everybody. <laughs> um, I didn't show it here, but these are pyramidal cells in these mini columns and pyramidal cells always have an apical dendrite. So I'm, ass I'm assuming this is either layer three, two, three, or five. These, these, I think actually this is going on two, in the upper layers and the lower layers. And all those cells send an apical dendrite up into the up to the layer one area, and I think that the the, the common theta may be distributed across the apical dendrite. So in some sense, this is clocked and unclocked. <laughs> it's like these guys propagate at their own rate, but they also comparing it to a base theta, where I think all the all these cells will be are getting their they might be getting their base theta on their apical dendrites, and they're being driven locally at the at the theta plus uh, frequency. Um, down in, in their particular layer. So it's, it's a little bit like you said, Kevin, but I think it's also it reliant on this sort of distributed clock. No, I, I, I agree is if you have two different mechanisms, one of which is inherently uh, low latency that allows you to distribute, you know, a reference signal, and then the other one inherently has a higher latency, so it can propagate across and, and have those, those phase differences. Uh, I, I it, it, make, it makes sense to me because if, if you have the mechanisms in there where you have low latency, high latency propagation of signals within yeah. the cortex, then it falls out. Yeah. Anyway, it's a very, it, I, I would have never guessed it would be this complicated if you asked me this 10 years ago. Um, but in hindsight, it seems to make sense that it would be this complicated because it's doing something really complicated. <laughs> so, um, it's definitely an appealing image. Like you can imagine traveling waves going over this, but at different points in time, the traveling wave is different. It's like you have these different swim lanes where. Yeah. So, yeah. so you could detect a traveling wave if you recorded this, but there's like nuance there to where it's actually a, broken into different. You, you know what I'm saying? It's hard. Yeah, to I do. Yeah, I, I know. I think I do. You know, it is. It's a little odd to imagine if, if we're going to have these swim lanes and they're running at slightly different frequencies. 
um, uh, it's, um, you, there has to be the tissue structure to support that. And, um, you know, why, why do I, when I go one direction, do I get a swim lane of, of phase shift and I go in the other direction, I get um, uh, an orientation shift. Well, it's there. Well, at least the orientation shift is there. We know that. There's no theories at all, as far as I can tell, why there are slabs. None. I have, I've been looking. I can't find anything that says, here's why we think there's a slab, <laughs> like functionally. Um, so it's appealing that, you're right, it's appealing that maybe that's the purpose for it. Um, and you've got these two things. But then interesting, it's like, why is it structured like this? How come it ends up this way? There must be. And so I think what I've come to believe here um, is that almost all the calculations that are being done by the cortex are being done by interneurons. And the pyramidal cells are really there for, for are doing the sort of temporal memory context thing we think about all the time. Like you have a bunch of cells in the layer that say these are all up into the same thing, but in a different context, one cell becomes active. But I, when I start thinking about it, I say, no, you know, what's gonna cause a, a mini column to be all the cells be the same is gonna be a, a bipolar cell. And, um, and we've already determined that with the trans, uh, temporal memory. Now, why would it go, why would you get phase in this direction and orientation in this direction? Well, there are those other weird shells in there, the, the chandelier cells and these other interneurons. And I've come to believe that all this calculation is being done at the interneuron level. And, and then you just assign a bunch of pyramidal cells to, to each of the elements that are created by the interneurons. And that, these allow you to create context. Um, so I need to, to really understand how the mechanism for this propagation, we'd have to look very carefully at the interneurons um, and, 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 and there, there is a lot of literature on them. Um, and I think, uh, I think once before I was mentioning, I kind of recall that there was a, I read, a, I read a, a, an article that one of these interneurons really has this sort of a planar sort of aspect to its projections and someone else looked for it and couldn't find it, but I think it's there. Um, there's another interesting question is this would imply that this sort of slab uh, behavior would exist in every cortical region. And I looked uh, briefly, I mean, I spent like 20 minutes searching, uh, trying to find papers that talked about slab type of receptive fields in other cortical regions. I didn't see anything. Uh, I didn't see anything that contradicted it. I just, people just haven't done this kind of analysis. They just haven't had, they haven't know what to look for. Uh, as far as there's I can stuff, tell. Uh, there's a lot known in the auditory cortex in A1 about kind of frequency mappings and how that's laid out. I wonder if you might find something analogous there. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. And what is, uh, if along the ISO orientation slab direction, that red arrow, what, and you might have said this before, what is the main change that, that's along that? These guys, are, all, like these mini com, all these mini comms are firing at the same, uh, they're not firing, they're, they're you can imagine there. Um, you can imagine the, the imagine there's a bipolar cell that represent the minicom. Okay, that these so there's a set of bipolar cells. Those bipolar cells are firing at the same theta plus delta frequency. So they're all, and and these are phase shifted. So this is the ring attractor. These would be six six elements in a ring. So you, you, this this guy is. Um, is first and within a theta, within this theta plus delta frequency, there would be go bing, 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 back to the beginning, bing, 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 and so on. And actually, these are long; these are much longer than this. So you could have a you could have multiple peaks going along. Um, so these are the these these mini columns are now the elements of the ring attractor. So this is this is I'm highlighting one ring attractor here, um, and this and this progression of phase peak is moving along. Isn't there experimental data on what the change in the receptive feels as you walk along that red arrow? I, you know, I'm not aware of it, Subtime. Um, and I, 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 there's so much paper. I, I just, I need to spend a quality day or two doing research on the papers. But as far as I know, I have not found anything which says what these, why, what happens along the slab. If you go far well, enough, then you switch to it. Then you go from left eye preference to right eye preference. Yeah, that's that, different. Right, right. That's the next block over. So that's well documented. But what's happening across here? It seems they just say, yeah, they're all the same orientation. That's in, it. In, the, in the papers that have looked at traveling waves, have they elucidated the two-dimensional structure of the traveling waves? No, you know, I looked at some of those papers and, and they really didn't talk about this at all. Um, there might be more that I, I'm sure there's more that I didn't see, Kevin, but I haven't seen that yet. It's, 
it's like, I saw some papers that had like titled they're like traveling waves in the neocortex, but when you read them, they're really not about this at all. Because one of the <laughs> one of the things that occurs to me, because we know that traveling waves exist uh, in uh, in embryonic uh, 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 development, and well, I'm just wondering, yeah, especially then, like in the retina. Right. Well, that's where they look for it for for one thing. But what I'm thinking is, is that you're saying, why should it orient it, itself this way? And the question is, if the traveling waves started out early, and I'm just wondering if the system could self-organize around this, and they might be like, you know, strict rectilinear slabs. They might be representing- Well, they're not, the they're not rectilinear slabs. If right. You so, so, look at, um, so if you look at the propagation wavefront of the wave of, 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 the, of the traveling wave, it might actually reflect that local structure. Uh, uh, it might. Let me just see if I can find. I'm that. just thinking that it's it's a train it's a training thing, and the thing self organizes to exploit that. Hang on a second. I thought I had a picture in here. Um, I, like, I can't read this. The people here we go. I have to, my my scroll bar was covered up. Um, no, give me one more second here. I think I had, um, um, oh, here's a picture. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So this is, um, this is, this is like a, an image looking down on the surface of the cortex. And the, it, can you see these light bars here? Yep. Those light ones are the ISO uh, orientation slabs. <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of wiggly and they get wider and they go all over the place. And, and then they come to these points of uh, singularity um, here. So it's not clear, you know, what we're proposing is that there's a propagation of, um, of a phase along these, these contour lines, um, uh, which is perfectly understandable. It's not like this one wave of something going across everything here. It's, it's not like that. Um, um, but I, I don't think this is inconsistent at all with what I was talking about. So I, I don't even know if there's recording techniques that can figure that out today. The, I mean, the, you'd phase, need to, the, the phase shift? Yeah, because you need to be able to record from hundreds or thousands of neurons with a high temporal resolution simultaneously in order yeah, to really do this. Yeah, or even just two, you could do it. You, you might see a, you saw a, con, a consistent, but see, it wouldn't even be a consistent phase relationship. And, and, and it would require, in this case, if you were doing this in V1, it would require the animal to be moving. Because remember, we're talking about flow bits here. So you know, it's, it's like you, you have to activate these complex cells, you do it properly, the animal really should be moving, and then, you, and then you'd see, depending on how fast the animal moving, that's how much of a, um, the frequency would change, and then you have to be able to see the phase shift between them. I, I don't know, I, I, I have to think, I, I'm, I'm making this up off the top of my head. It, it would be hard, you'd have to make sure you're designing the experiment properly to record, to you know this. And, and, I, and I'm with you, it could very easily have been missed. Um, uh, and also, I think it's it's not the pyramidal cells you have to be looking for. I think it's actually the bipolar cells. <laughs> See, and that gets to be a subtle distinction because it's the bipolar cells who are really doing this. It's the pyramidal cells themselves are are coming along for the ride, and and they may not be firing it all the time. It's 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 the it's the bipolar cells that would be firing all the time. So um, I I bet you there's a lot of literature out there that'll lead to this. Um, um, in one way or the other, it, it's going to be just difficult to take time consuming to find it uh, and go through it and, and, and search for it. But I, I, mm. again, as I said earlier, it's exciting to work on. And I think it's, uh, I think, I think this can be solved. Um, I think it's, some, I think we have enough not information probably collectively in the world of neuroscience literature to piece together the answer. here. But too early to know for certain. Okay, I, I want to end there. I want to make sure we have time for two guys. So. Uh, uh, Jeff, just a quick question. Uh, yeah. Anatomically, what determines those uh, borders, like the black borders? What is, what is it that's... What there? are these black borders, these things here? Are you asking what this is or what these little squiggly lines are? No, no, the black borders that... Uh, the this is, I think these are um, uh, ocular dominance columns, meaning the cells in here are primarily from the left eye and these are primarily from the right eye and these are primarily from the left eye and these are primarily from the right eye, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. So it's a more like a functional division. It's not something you can see. No, 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 no. That's just, yeah, it's not, you can't see it. It's basically, the basic idea is they're, they're taking another modality, ocular dominance, and they just drop it on top of this base modality. But again, okay. you don't need to have two eyes to see. Um, I, and, and so vision, in theory, is not dependent on ocular dominance at all. 
Um, and so I, I tend to ignore that component uh, because that's a very specific thing to vision. Um, uh, you know, wouldn't apply to a fingertip or something like that. Okay. So, so we're, you know, we're looking, uh, that, that's why I didn't even mention it. There's um, just one other uh, comment. It, it may not be at all applicable exactly to what you're doing here. But there is a not very popular, but it does exist uh, uh, algorithm for doing uh, edge detection. And the, the notion is, is that if you look at the spatial frequencies, the places where all the phases line up coherently uh, at, you know, at a single point, like, you know, a peak or something like that is where an edge or a valley is. Yeah. So uh, if you have multiple frequencies where they're actually differentiated, the, you kind of get a salience measure that, okay, it's supported by this frequency, yeah. then the next frequency, the next yeah, frequency. Yeah. I mean, again, Kevin, I'm arguing that the entire, almost all the things people thought about of, of orientation in V1 is wrong. It applies correctly to, to layer four only, but all the other layers which have complex cells, I'm arguing those aren't even, those aren't feature detectors. Those are movement detectors that floated. You know, and, and remember, I, get, I talked about that research with the random bit, um, uh, images and uh, they kind of concluded, yeah, these are like these are like movement detectors. These aren't edge detectors. So right. So I I I didn't mean to say that I'm I'm ascribing that to being edge detectors. What I'm saying is that there's a significance when the phases all line up. Yeah, I just don't know if that applies to movement. It, that seems like it applies to like trying to, to um, detect edges as opposed to trying to detect flow and movement. Maybe it does. I, I don't know. But um, I, almost all the literature, which is about how how do these uh, orientation uh, preferences come about? Well, a good portion of it will be incorrect if I'm right about this, um, because the complex cells are not doing what people think they're doing. Right. They're doing something the, else. the one place I would argue that it might be relevant, uh, not to the uh, somatosensory, but to the extent that the, the, uh, the vision has a contributory signal to support whatever the motion is, that's a way of, of basically getting salience out of a very confusing uh, set of things moving around and shifting and stuff. So Yeah, well, I guess it, the question is, how do you determine, um, you know, flow, uh, movement? There's a the question how that happens. But remember, um, remember again, those dot, those random dot images work really well for complex cells. And so there's no spatial frequencies in them at all. There's zero spatial frequencies uh, in in those uh, in those images, and they and they actually selected complex cells better than the <laughs> the activated complex cells better than edges. <laughs> okay. So, so that would argue that that that's if I understand spatial frequencies, I would argue that um, that spatial frequencies. So those were static images. I'm saying if the thing is running around and yeah. everything's flowing across them, there is an implicit flow there that I, I don't- Yeah, flow, but again, the, the, that evidence suggested that spatial frequency had nothing to do with it, right? If you have, if you have random bit patterns that, that activate those cells better in movement, then, then I can't- well, Was it under movement or a static image? No, those are moving, they're moving, they were, no, the, the static image didn't do anything. Um, to, get comp, to get those complex cells to fire, they had to, they had to show this random bit pattern moving. Flit, okay, and, all right. And, and then, then they, that, that worked best. That was the best way of activating complex cells, not edges, but moving bit patterns. <laughs> okay, point yeah. taken. Uh, yeah. I'll let Subutai. Yeah. All right, let's go to Subutai here. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Subutai, you're muted. Yeah, okay, yeah. Mind. Okay. Um, I'm going to go. Let's see. I'll turn my video off. I got a couple. So of this is going to be a pretty big switch in topics. <laughs> uh, hopefully, it's not. Uh, so we're going to go from um, talking about ISO orientation and mini columns and stuff to how we might get machine intelligence. <laughs> um, so this is um, this is a paper I read over the weekend that I thought was very thought provoking and. Um, I was talking with Jeff about whether we had research meeting topics or not, and um, I just decided to kind of put this together at the last hour um, before 10. So this might be a little bit uh, disjointed. I apologize for that. But um, I did think this was a, a very thought-provoking paper. So the paper is um, 
called AIGAs, AI Learning Algorithms, an Alternate Paradigm for Producing AGI by Jeff Kloon. So some of you may have read this paper already. He released it, I think, last year. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff coming around and I, uh, you know, along these lines that are uh, quite interesting. And he kind of critiqued uh, the state of both uh, kind of machine intelligence or, or machine learning uh, world, as well as in, in part of his paper, some of the neuroscience inspired approaches. And he's proposing a particular way that he thinks is gonna be the fastest way to get to machine intelligence. Um, and whether or not we agree with it or not, I'll, I'll have a take on that at the end. Um, it's still a very kind of interesting um, set of ideas uh, that a subset of the machine learning field is now gravitating uh, towards this uh, that I wanted to share. Okay. Um, so this is the, <coughs> and, and, to, and if you guys, if anyone else has read this paper, feel free to jump in as well. This is the paper that's um, up on archive, uh, released last year. Uh, I found a couple of talks by him um, on YouTube. So I put together a short set of slides from taken from his slides. Very, I only created one slide of my own. Uh, so that helped me put this together very quickly. Uh, but I did want to go through that and see what you guys think in, uh, of this. Um, OK. So can uh, you guys can see this. So, so first, he talks about kind of the manual path to AI. And this is kind of the dominant machine learning paradigm, uh, which is basically you identify these key building blocks, whether it's backpropagation and uh, ReLU and sigmoids and all of that. And then you try to put these together into more and more complex networks and trying to solve more and more complex tasks. And it's all sort of hand design, you know, in machine learning, it's sort of bottom up mathematical principles. Um, and you know, he's saying, is this even possible? It's this Herculean task of this huge space of possible algorithms that you, you might be uh, trying to create and this huge space of possible networks, debugging and optimizing these things are a nightmare. And you need these huge teams of people working on it, you know, such as uh, OpenAI and, um, you know, Google and so on. And each one, you know, you put more and more uh, compute resources, more and more data into it, and you try to kind of build up bottom up from that. Um, and so this is, this is kind of the dominant uh, paradigm today. In some sense, what we're doing is also kind of in this path, except our key bu building blocks are neuroscience-based things. So, you know, whether it's dendrites or sparsity or grid cells, you know, we're reading a lot of stuff from the neuroscience, but then we're trying to manually create these networks and figure out, you know, how to put it all together and not into, uh, into these working systems, okay? Um, so his, so his, in machine learning, here's an example of the types of building blocks that are there. Um, you know, convolutional networks, their, their attention mechanisms, you know, different loss functions, uh, uh, models, Bayesian methods, active learning, this, you know, huge list of things that people, uh, literally a million people around the world are trying to do various, you know, take examples of this, uh, you know, try to create a network that solves some specific problems. And the question is, is this even an efficient approach? Are we able to find all these building blocks? You know, can we create uh, systems based on that? Um, his, and the basic one, one kind of lesson that the community has learned over the years um, is that hand designed pipelines are ultimately outperformed by learned solutions. Um, as you have more data and more Computer algorithms and computer vision is a and reinforcement learning are really good examples of this. So, in the beginning, people used to design features by hand, um, and Hog and Sift uh, are examples of, of features that were uh, you know, in the 90s people used a lot. And now in deep learning, you can pretty much learn these end to end. You don't you can just give it pixels and data. You don't need to hand design features. Uh, the learning algorithms are powerful enough and uh, to do a better job than any hand design things. Uh, same thing now with architectures. Uh, they're typically, you know, they used to be uh, hand designed, uh, but now you can, through hyperparameter search and meta learning algorithms, you can figure out what architectures are are best. Um, and you know, hyperparameters are rather than manually tuning the learning rates and so on. Now you can, uh, through various mechanisms, some of which we've learned as well, 
um, you know, you can learn what parameters are best for the thing. And same thing with data augmentation. Uh, it used to be the case that you could, you could hand design specific data augmentation techniques, but now you can run this, you know, huge meta learning algorithms and it figures out what's the best data augmentation and that can do better than any manual uh, design, uh, manual data augmentation task. So there's tons and tons of examples of this that through learning uh, and optimization, you can figure out the stuff better than uh, manually hand-tuned uh, kind of networks. So what he's proposing is, well, you want to learn as much as possible. Um, you don't want to take all of these manual building blocks and hand tune these uh, things. It's a very, very um, ex you know, ex manually expensive process, but now that computing is becoming che cheaper and cheaper, you should generate the algorithms themselves um, and take the, the outer loop itself can be automated. Uh, and isn't you, this you, just like evolutionary algorithms? Isn't, wouldn't that, isn't it's, it's slightly different. So he makes this point, this is not just evolutionary algorithms. So he, the analogy is evolution. Um, yeah. And so that's his sort of existence proof here is the earth, you know, evolution uh, with very, very simple rules led to intelligent systems. But the machine learning algorithms today that do this are much more efficient than evolution. And the problem with evolution is that it's, it's not very efficient. <laughs> uh, at least the evolutionary algorithms that we know of are extremely inefficient. And this is such a high dimensional search space. But the meta learning algorithms today are much more efficient than evolution itself. So, so it's uh, sort of like, like evolutionary algorithms, but don't, don't use nature's way of random variation and selection. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, be able to come up with a better evolutionary algorithm. Exactly. Yeah, we have much better search techniques now than evolution does did. Um, and so he comes, he's sort of proposing these three pillars that we need. <laughs> one is, uh, the first one is to meta learn the architectures. Um, and that's sort of fairly well known in the literature, I believe. Um, I'm not as familiar with all of these. Uh, so, and, and Lucas, you might be a lot more familiar with this, these, some of these things. But the second thing is where you meta learn the learning algorithms themselves. Um, and I'll give you an example of that uh, in a second that's very relevant to us. Um, and then the third one is you actually generate the learning environment itself. That is the data sets and the benchmarks and those things are also learned. Um, and he has a couple of good examples of, of what that might look like as well. Okay. And the problem and the big issue is that handcrafting each of these things is really, really slow and is you know, limited by our own intelligence and the time we have to do it. You know, why not let the computer uh, kind of figure a lot of these things out? Um, and so his hypothesis is that by doing this, you're going to need fewer building blocks. You still need to come up with building blocks. It's not like you don't have a manual process in this. You still need to have a build, set of building blocks, but it's a much smaller set and all the work in combining them is, is much easier. Uh, and this definitely resonates with me because we've spent a lot of time kind of coming up with neuroscience-based you know, building blocks, but then you know, to get act things actually working, there's a huge amount of, sort of tweaking and, and you know, figuring out what's the data set and you know, figuring out what the right learning rules, the exact learning rules are, what the right parameters are and all of that. We spend a ton of time on this stuff. So the problem at least resonates with me, whether the solution is uh, his solution or not is, is separate. But um, the basic idea is you need fewer building blocks uh, if you were to do it this but, way. And by the way, just, you know, the way I've always felt that is like, you think about, oh, we did the temple memory and, um, and uh, uh, anomaly detection and all that tweaking we had to do there. I always assumed that all that tweaking is because we didn't have the algorithms right. Uh, they were close, but they weren't quite right. And we didn't really know how to make them right. So we, but I always felt like we really understood the algorithms better than, than, than it wouldn't be hard, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah. So I, I know, I think that's right. And that's part of his thing is that you, well, you look meta on the algorithms themselves. Well, so. may, maybe, but, but to me, it wasn't like, oh, let's learn those algorithms. Like, no, we didn't get the neuroscience complete yet. So I always felt like once we thoroughly understood the neuroscience, like um, uh, it, not down at the level of like, you know, ion channels and stuff, but really a lot of algorithms, then, then it'd be easy to implement these things. But it, and so well, it, it's a question. Yeah, but I, but I think there's a big gap still, uh, you know, from the 
time you sort of started looking at mini columns and dendrites and sparsity and all of those different principles to the yeah. time we actually got stuff working well in practice, there was a lot of tweaking and you know yeah, the no, details of the and, learning and rules and how you choose because, winner take yeah, yeah and, and that's I don't the think, part that potentially could be automated but, but it's seen. interesting like could for example right now all right so now i'm totally convinced that the whole system works on reference frames and metric spaces and yeah. um would would with any kind of learn, meta learning algorithm figure that out no uh, no so and he he sort of make make and those would be the building blocks that you'd put in but exactly how you implement reference frames so it works in real, real world, air, you know, tasks and stuff is a really difficult task. You know, how do you, you know, it's it's one thing to have the cortical column roughly laid out, and for the the gap between that and actual working systems is really, really hard. Well, um, I guess and that's I guess the gap that some of you know. Again, it's not that there's nothing manual needed in that, and you know, I don't, I certainly don't think it's going to be completely automated, but automation in that process. I guess to me it's good. like that's it's his, like, that's his maybe there's like ten things like you know the, the temporal memory context is the mini comps hypothesis and now we have reference frames you know and until until you to me it feel like you need to your best discover those in biology and and until you do until you know all of them it's going to be just really hard to do anything but once you do know all of them it won't be so hard that's how I always yeah. viewed it um, yeah and I I I think that's that's true too. Uh, so, that, so that implies that so he, that's not his necessarily his viewpoint. No, because that implies uh, yeah. like we have more neuroscience work to do. It's, it's, it's always been my take. It's like, you know, the quickest way to get there is to ba understand those building blocks. And the only way you're going to figure out those building blocks is by studying the brain. Right. Um, and we don't know them all yet. So don't yeah, give up but, on uh, the brain. <laughs> yeah. But if I were to kind of represent his point of view, it'd be like, yeah, that's that's fine. And, but then once you have the building blocks, or some set of building blocks, combining them in a way and figuring out the details of them so they actually work well is is quite a, a big task. I guess uh, I guess we don't know. Um, I'm arguing. Well, it was that, definitely the case for temporal memory. I know uh, because because we didn't have enough building blocks there. I you know there's so, there's so many things I know are wrong about that, but it was pretty good and it and it highlighted a few uh, neuroscience principles that no one knew about. Um, so I guess I guess it, we're talking about hypothetical here. It's always a like, hey, do we have enough building blocks to, to today to turn on the automated meta learning systems to build something, or is that a hopeless task and we need more building blocks? And to me, it's always been well, like I think the part uh, you probably didn't see as much is sort of the detailed neuroscience until you have NuPic working code, uh, where every detail of it is actually work. And I still don't know whether what we have is the best. Uh, actual implementation or not? Right? There's still a ton of manual work that went into. No, it I understand with, that. Uh, I understand and, that. And totally. that's the part that could be. I know, but my point is, I think that manual work is because we were missing all these other major pieces, and therefore, even our models were wrong. They were better than other models. They were getting at some truths, but they were basically had missing components. And um, and because we missed those components, any implementation we do is going to be difficult. That's my yes. Yeah, so I, I think. I think. Yeah, so I think there's two parts. One is, do we have the right set of building blocks and components? And if we don't have those, then nothing we do is going to work. Yeah. Right? But uh, the other part is, even once we have that, there's still a ton of engineering. Work I don't. To do. I don't know if that. I think that's un, unclear. Okay. How do we know that? We've never had the right set of building blocks, and so we've always been trying to make things work with a partial set that aren't correct, and 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 the pieces don't fit together right, and so on. So I I think it's un Undetermined. If if we knew all the correct principles by which the brain works, would it inherently be very very difficult to put something together? I don't know. I don't think we know the answer to that. The only thing we know right now, it's very difficult to put together a partial set of building blocks, some of which are wrong. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, uh, that's the only thing we know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. That's fair enough. I, I yeah. I don't think we know that. Right, I look. Um, I, I'm just yeah. giving my take on this. I, it's 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 interesting. Yeah. yeah. But. Um. So. You know, certainly in the AI community, that it takes a ton of work to get those working. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't know with neuroscience if we had all of the build, right building blocks in place, could we then just sort of code it up and it would work? Uh, um, okay, let me continue with with this. Uh, so the the issue, the problem with this is it takes it's going to be extremely computationally expensive. But his take as well, we're just getting computational the, the our 
availability of computation is just increasing exponentially. So this is going to be a solved problem. <laughs> um, and his take out, okay, why is this likely to win? Well, it's fairly obvious. Um, you know, what does GA stand for again? I'm sorry. Um, uh, generating algorithms. Generating so algorithms. He's, okay. he's arguing for AI generating algorithms. Got it. All right. Um, and so the thing is the the amount of human ingenuity you need gets smaller and smaller. You still need it, but uh, you know the work of parameter tuning and you know trying out lots of different variations and stuff like that. If you could do this, you know you need much less um, manual work there, and it and you could automate uh, a lot more of that stuff. Um, okay, so if we go to these. Uh, AI generating algorithms. He gives a, a you know one example of that that I thought was quite interesting for for us, um, and that's in the realm of catastrophic forgetting uh, or continuous learning. Um, so this you know we've talked about this in the past. This is uh, a big problem with today's machine learning, and so the basic uh, framework here is you learn task A, then you learn task B, but when you learn task B, you forgot you basically tend to forget everything about A, and so you know, humans and animals don't ha have this problem. You know, how do we create systems that can solve the catastrophic forgetting problem to continuously learn? So you can, you know, learn a continuous set of tasks without forgetting the past set. Um, and, you know, he's a list of all of these different uh, proposed solutions that are all basically, he would put in the manual category. In, you know, interesting, he has sort of sparse representations as one of them. Um, and you know, people have tried taking each of these things and say, hey, maybe generative replay um, uh, could help catastrophic forgetting. And so you have hundreds of researchers that have uh, created papers with various tweaks on generative replay and trying to figure out whether, okay, does it or does it not solve the catastrophic forgetting problem? And so they came up, so he's proposing um, this kind of meta approach. And the way it would go is the following is that you have some outer loop that's generating your parameters, uh, theta one, and, and then you have um, a training, you have your inner loop, where, which is completely automated, where you train uh, on a set of parameters and you, you, know, you go from, you start with a set of parameters, theta one, and you train it, so you get theta one, one, and you keep going, and at the end of it, you evaluate how well your sequence of this inner loop worked on this meta loss function. Um, and then based on that, uh, you differentiate or you use backprop through this entire process in the top row, come up with a, whoops, uh, come up with a better set of uh, parameters, theta two, and then you go through the entire process again, evaluate the loss, you do backpropagation or some optimization method uh, that goes all the way back and generates a new set of uh, um, things. So, you know, you could think of evolutionary algorithms as an example of, of something like this, but uh, we have now much better mechanisms, he claims, of going from theta one to theta two and so on. And in the case, so if you were to apply this to catastrophic forgetting, what you'd get is something like this. So you first, you, you start with a set of parameters, you learn task one, then you learn task two, and you keep going until you learn task T, and then you evaluate on all of the tasks. I'm sorry, what um, are the tasks? tasks? I'm sorry, the tasks. So a task would might be like, uh, in the continuous learning case, it would be like uh, learning, let's say a couple of categories. Let's say you take uh, ImageNet. It's got uh -huh. a thousand categories. You learn two categories at first. Okay. okay. These are you all. You learn the next two categories and the next two, and okay. you don't want to forget the first two. Yeah, and yeah, then you yeah, learn yeah. the next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, so you learn kind of categories in sequence in this particular case, mm -hmm. um, but then at the end you you evaluate how well it learned all the categories, and of course with backprop, the typical backprop, it would do horribly on all the categories. It would only learn the last two, um, uh, but you evaluate on all of them. Um, and in, you know, when, he, when he proposed, you back propagate through the whole thing, generate a new set of parameters and repeat this entire process. Okay, is that kind of clear? Uh, it's not clear why that gets better. What, what, what's, why yeah, is how does that different what we do right now? Oh, it's, it's quite different in that this is all automated. Oh, what's happening between a theta one and theta two? I'm sorry. 
It's like um, there's a, an optimization process that's running and a meta optimization process that's running that's going from theta one to theta two. So inside in here, you might have something like back propagation, let's say running. Uh -huh. Okay. So this this what it says task one here, this is an entire process of training one network yeah. on two categories. I got that. And then you train that same network on the next two categories and so on. So that we all we do. But then the new thing is this meta objective. You say, okay, how well did this whole thing do? Um, you know, and you can look at the area under the curve or some metric that says how well did it learn all of the tasks, all of the categories. And based on how well it did, that optimization process, in this case, can back propagate through this entire learning process, generate a new set of hyperparameters, and in this case, actual starting weights, um, and go through this entire process. So, so this this entire slide is automated. Yeah, yeah, but okay. in, in our case, the process of going from theta one to theta two is manual. Yeah, but but in this case, it's it's right at the moment. It's sort of magical. Like, yeah, you get to the end, you do some meta analysis, and now you know how to update the theta too. But I don't, it's not clear at all what that is. Um, yeah. So he describes. I think that's um, that's kind of beyond the scope of my present <laughs> quick presentation today. <laughs> we could talk about it, but uh, it, reminds, it reminds me. I, that I, old, I need to. I, I need to. You know, I need. I'm to sure he has it. It must be there. But it reminds me of old Sam Harris comment where the science is at the blackboard and he's got all these complicated things. And in the middle, it says, "Then a miracle happens, and you get the result." Yeah. And it's like, okay, you get to the end of the first row, and a miracle happens, and you know what they're doing the second row. It's like, okay. yeah, yeah. So this, this is. It's not a. It's not a miracle in the sense that it. He has. He does have a paper on this. Uh, yeah. I just no. didn't have time to go okay. through it in detail. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I saw him give a talk uh, last last year at it. I so, think it's worth, if people are interested, we could go through that paper. It's quite interesting, I think. So, so what I'm getting, I'm, today, I'm not prepared to go through the, the process of how he get, goes from theta one to so, theta So two. what I'm getting from this is that he basically, when he's doing the loss function, he's taking into account the successive losses uh, in the forward direction and somehow coming up with a... Well, okay. Yeah. So what this loss function will say is, will measure is how well did you learn? categorize all all of these ta categories right but so but you said he's basically running the thing in reverse to do that so it's like a meta no no problem. no 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 the, the loss function is computed just normally so let's say this is ImageNet. the first task you learn categories one and two right in task two you learn categories three and four only in task three you learn categories five and six only and then in task T, you would learn category 999 and 1,000. No, no, I understand okay? that. I'm and then at, at the end, at the end, you would evaluate the uh, validation set on all 1,000 categories, and you get your error. Yeah, you get your error. Then how do you turn that into a new set of parameters? Is, is oh, my that's, question. Yeah, that's the same question Jeff is asking. And, and right. What uh, I'm saying is, so there was, is so he back propagates through the whole thing here. And that's what I, I was saying. Th that's exactly what I was, I was trying to feed back to you was that basically you could look at, you know, as he moves through, you know, what is being forgotten across all these tasks by moving backwards, he can come up with a, uh, a better notion of, you know, how to deal with the lossage as it's coming through. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, that's... yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 That's right. So the, if, if you're able to back propagate through here, you would get some, gradient yeah it says it under that, theta ones like the gradient with respect to exactly theta ones. yeah and yeah you'd get a gradient in this big that, space yeah. that says how should i improve these parameters to make this error better right? so That's in essence he's getting credit is. assignment across the 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 entire exactly. task. all right yes yes yeah and and the details of that um i don't know right now i i would need to go to this paper called uh, uh, and go through it in detail which i'd like to do at some point to understand it, but um, but basically he does have a mechanism for doing that. They do have that, and and I'll give the uh, the rough idea for it later. Uh, just just to jump ahead, a little bit, is there a any kind of neurobiology analog to what he's proposing? No. Um, I will get to a little bit of that in a bit. Um, get when it comes to the building blocks. The, the high level analogy is that this is evolution, but the, it, it, the algorithm is not an evolutionary algorithm. It's a 
it's a more efficient optimization algorithm. Okay, fair enough. Okay. okay, so once you've done all of this stuff, then what do you, you do what you call meta testing. <laughs> so now you take a new set of categories, a new thing, and you go through a training process. So this is meta testing training. <laughs> Oops. So you go through a training process and then you evaluate how well it retained all of the different uh, categories. So that's meta testing testing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the terminology gets a little weird here. But anyway, so basically you go through all of this, this huge optimization thing on the top left. Then at the end, you evaluate it on a catastrophic forgetting task with completely new categories that it hasn't seen before. Um, then this was kind of the interest, one interesting piece is that um, the new building block they put in was a, a neuromodulatory network. So he, here he says, well, if you look at neuroscience, there is these neuromodulatory pathways that can affect kind of plasticity and, and the learning system. You know, whether it's dopamine or others, it can uh, affect you know, how fast you, you learn. So let's just put that in. So he puts in a, a network um, that basically is like an attentional type network. This thing is, in his words, it's looking at the data and trying to say, oh, is this a whole new category or not? And if it's a new category, then based on whether it's a new category or not, I'm going to impact the, the gradients that are coming through. I'm going to impact the learning process itself. Okay, so this is, is an example of kind of a manual building block that he throws in there uh, into this Uber optimization process. Okay, so the red path is your standard convolutional neural network. The blue path is a separate thing that is Basically, all it's doing is updating um, how fast these things learn or don't learn okay. in, a, in, a, in a kind of a precise way in, in this part, part here. So uh, what another way of saying is that the, the upper path is kind of a novelty detector, and based upon that, it makes more flexible the lower path? Yeah, and that would be, yeah, yeah, that could be one example of this. Yeah, uh, it, you know, exactly what this is, ends up doing it's not clear to me because I haven't read the paper, but that's how he explained it to us. It's like a, uh, something that tries to detect, oh, this is a new task that I have not learned before. So, so that, that work is the, the continuation of that work we discussed from uh, Thomas last year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When we met him, he said they were working on this. Uh, this exactly. This yeah, paper. yeah. Um, it, I think it's a slightly, it might be slightly different, but it's a continuation of that, yeah. Of that same basic idea. So the, um, here's another picture of it. It you know gets some input, and for each unit in this layer, it tries to decide whether it's going to learn or not learn. Okay, so it's selective uh, plasticity. Okay, so the results are are quite amazing, uh, and what they get is. Um, if you look at the training accuracy and the test accuracy, if you look at the number of uh, classes you've seen, um, the, this approach uh, outperforms all other approaches by a, by a fairly large uh, uh, margin. And so the, here's a case where um, it goes through 600 categories, um, I think learning two at a time. So it's going through like 300 if that's the case, then it would have gone through 300 of these tasks where it's only two categories at a time, and it and it remembers uh, you know a very large chunk of this. Um, okay, the overall accuracy, and so what you have to do is compare this end accuracy against the accuracy of a pure kind of batch trained system. And well, he says in the left and right slide uh, graphs. I'm sorry. Um, I think the right side is really the main one. I think this is training. The training accuracy. This is the. Oh, okay, got sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the right one is really the one you should look at. Um, and he says, compared to, um, if you look at how much of an accuracy drop there is compared to a completely batch trained system, uh, you get about an eighty-eight percent accuracy drop. If you do standard backprop, doing continuous learning, you lose ninety-nine percent of the information, um, and with their technique, you only lose 
uh, accuracy drop, even though it went through 300 steps of this uh, uh, continuous learning problem. Um, and I thought this was interesting is one of the things they discovered is that uh, these networks uh, uh, learned sparsity really well. So, uh, you know, sparsity, sparse representations are a key, at least in their system, are a key aspect of this. Um, and they actually figured out how to do boosting, I think, relatively well because they had very few dead neurons. That was one of the points he, he makes there. Um, so do you know what uh, OML stands for? Uh, old machine, machine learning? learning? I don't remember. It, it's online. the previous it could be old online machine, machine learning. learning. Yeah, yeah. So they, they don't use, uh, they don't compare this to EWC and all of this? Is it the same parameter set? Um, I think EWC is um, not included in here, no. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not as good, I think, but. Yeah, I don't think EWC would do any, any anywhere near as, as good as this. Okay, so um, going back to this, this, so this was an example he set up meta learning the learning algorithm uh, where you're basically learning how to uh, train the system or you know how how fast learning should go when you when you present new categories um, and his the third pillar he says is basically there's hardly been any uh, work on this yet is to learn new kind of data set and benchmarks and uh, the the learning environment itself uh, can be learned. Um, and again, he uses evolution as, a, as an analogy. Um, he has a couple of analogies. One is evolution where, you know, let's say you've, you have trees, um, um, you know, maybe, you have, I don't actually remember the whole, uh, but the evolution, the environment itself is changing uh, during evolution. So first you have trees and you, you may have tons of leaves or maybe you have too many trees. And then I think you have, in this example, you have caterpillars, they start eating the leaves and then you have other stuff that eats caterpillars and then you have maybe giraffes that are eating the leaves and then you have pred predators that eat, you know, I don't know if they eat giraffes, but they, you know, <laughs> herbivores and stuff. So the, the basic idea is that the environment itself is changing and as the environment changes, you get more and more intelligent animals uh, emerging. So you want to um, uh, be able to having the right set of environments and data sets and benchmarks is very critical to this entire process. I think another example he used is, um, uh, you know, what they call curriculum learning, where you might need to train a system on simpler tasks first, and then gradually build up and train it on more and more complex tasks. And that's sort of similar to how humans learn, you know, as babies, we might be uh, exposed to much, much simpler environments and our parents are teaching us in a particular way. And, and then as we grow up, we gradually learn more and more complex uh, tasks. And that curriculum uh, itself is very, might be important. You know, it may be that if you just threw someone into a very complex environment, uh, they might not be able to learn nearly as effectively as if you were to properly, uh, you know, graduate the training. Uh, over time, but how do you exactly do that? What's best and what, how do the parameters change as you, as you go through that process? That is a complex process. So you might wanna learn that process itself. So, so it sounds like in a nutshell, he's found a way to automate generalization of, of a network. And if you, if you don't take the lesson from curriculum learning, it could learn the Laurent lessons for quite a while because it, it might have simplified a complex problem down to something simpler, which would handicap it from that point. So you kind of want to feed it a set of examples, as you say, that go into greater and greater complexity because from that notion, you might be able to reduce down to a fundamental set of rules that apply in, 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 in all uh, situations. Yeah, that's an example of what he's proposing. That, that's not the only thing, but that's an example. And, and we've talked about similar things too. And, you know, maybe we need to learn simple primitives like curvature and, 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 and smoothness and, and so on before we could learn more complex uh, objects and more complex shapes. Um, but, but it's not the only thing. The, the basic idea is that the whole entire environment that the 
system is embedded in, uh, you know, the details of how that environment works should be learned. Okay, and one, ex and one example of that might be going from simple to harder uh, tasks. Okay, so that's his overall kind of conclusion. He thinks uh, that working on these three pillars uh, is going to be the fastest path to reaching AGI. Uh, the manual path is not the way to go. Um, and that, you know, maybe you need the manual work to figure out what these building blocks are, but then at the end of the day, you need these other meta learning algorithms uh, uh, in there to, to really do, do well. Um, and then there's one other part I thought that was uh, in this paper that was relevant to us that um, I thought I'd bring up. He does discuss sort of neuroscience-based uh, approaches. So this is not what we're doing here. I just want to be clear, but he sort of critiques the neuroscience-based approach in the following way. He calls it the mimic path um, and that it's that, that involves neuroscience is studying animal brains and attempting to reverse engineer how engine intelligent works. And in his example, um, the mimic path tries to uh, recreate brains in excruciating detail, you know, as much faithful detail as possible. And the blue brain project is an example of this. Um, and, you know, he says these are worthwhile independently just because it, he's, so he's not saying they shouldn't exist, but he does not think that's gonna be the fastest way to uh, it, intelligent systems, get, get to intelligent systems. Um, and his two, he had two critiques of this, which I thought were, were relevant. Uh, and we've come across this uh, scenario too. Of course, I, I just wanna say again, we're not doing the mimicry path, but these critiques do apply to us. Um, and we've faced this before. Um, and the issues are that it's very, very slow to produce experimental data. Uh, and the technology for recording from brains is really complex and the rate at which it's progressing is relatively slow. Um, and the technology for running the experiments is also incredibly complicated. Uh, and, and we've seen that it takes years for neuroscientists to often you know, figure out the, the, the recording techniques and run the experiment and then come up with the right results and analyze the results and all that stuff. So it is a slow way to get data. I don't know if everyone um, understands this, this is worth pointing out. The idea behind the mimic approach is you don't actually understand what's going on. You're, right. you're, you're just recreating the details and hope it's going to work, uh, yeah. which I think is nearly impossible. It, it's, it's, it's so remotely possible that that would work because there's so many parameters, you don't know which ones are important and therefore you just can't get it right. Um, yeah. So I think that approach is never going to work. It doesn't mean yeah. it's not valuable, but it, it's right. it, it's so far from what we're doing. It's I just want to make sure everyone understands that. <laughs> yeah, that's why I wanted to. I, I yeah, I, you know, I, I just I wanted to emphasize too. It's not what we're doing. I think we're trying to understand yeah. computationally. I mean, they're, they are literally just wiring up a bunch of things and say what is and turning it on and say what does it do? Yeah, you yeah. know, with no with no function at all other than does it map physiology in the brain? I mean, there's there's no concept at all what it should be doing. Yeah. I, I totally agree. However, I think these two issues, these two are issues for us though. Yeah. Uh, the fact that, you know, neuroscience is very slow to produce new data and you run new yeah. experiments. And that's one, one fundamental kind of thing, friction. The yeah. other friction, this is, these are my words, it's not exactly his words, but the neuroscience community itself is a source of friction because, you know, their goals are not necessarily to create machine intelligence. Uh, in my experience, 98% of them are not computer scientists and have a lot of trouble understanding computation and algorithms. So yeah. when we try to talk about our stuff and try to talk about things at a functional perspective, it's really, really hard to, uh, whereas when I talk to computer scientists and other people, they understand it instantly. Um, but in the neuroscience community, they have a lot of trouble understanding some of these things and, and we've faced this before. And, and you know, the third bullet, is sort of an outcome of that is that any data is interesting to them, regardless of whether it says anything about intelligent function. And we see this over and over again in these experiments that you know you make the tiniest tweak or you know you you have experiments on experiments and experiments that just uncover new data, detailed data about how some piece of the system works, 
with no theoretical framework whatsoever is just something new that <laughs> and yeah. that's why it's interesting um, and this is this is really this makes it really hard for us to go through papers and communicate with this community and and get the data that we need um, so I think this is a this is a valid friction source of friction that we face in in Jeff Kloon's case um, his conclusion is the mimicry approach uh, is unlikely to be the fastest path to AGI um, you know I don't agree that neuroscience based approaches are, are yeah I, I'm saying the mimicry, the mimicry is, path is, is, is never going to get to AGI yeah, it's just yeah. not going to happen it's yeah. impossible in my mind so yeah it's, it's not even unlikely yeah so uh, <laughs> I'll be more blunt about it, you know. Yeah, but but I do, uh, you know, I did want to point out that these two critiques do do apply, and we face this ourselves. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, it strikes uh, me. It, I'm going to jump right in here. It, you know, if you go back to that chart where you showed the the thetas going across, and then you have some function at the end. Um, there was there was two things in there that are really critical, and um, yeah, one? that that yeah. one right there. The first is. What is your uh, your 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 what's the L represent? I don't remember. What's, is that a Greek letter? What is that? How do you say that? Uh, that represents loss function. So loss. that's your okay. error so metric. Your, your loss function. Um, that, knowing what that is is critical. If your loss function is to do continuous learning on data sets like vision, well, that's what you're going to optimize for. And um, and I think I think one of the problems with uh, AI is they haven't had the right loss function. I haven't had close to it. If I were to say what the loss function is, I would say, oh, the loss function is you need to learn a uh, sensory motor model of the world that is able to predict the inputs continuously. Um, and uh, it's not like, you know, better on this type of training and so on. So if you want to get the AGI, that I guess, I guess my, I like this whole approach, but I guess I'm saying I don't think it's the approach to get the AGI because if you want to get the AGI, you have to have a very clear loss function um, and I don't think we're close to that yet. And neuroscience can tell us what that loss function is. And the second thing is you've got a set of parameters on the left. And that set of parameters is getting much more complicated than what people are thinking about today. Those parameters are like, include things like the tensional mechanism with the thalamus and neuromodulatory mechanisms and hierarchical construction of columns and so on. These are the parameters the brain works with. And if you don't have that right set of parameters and you don't have the right loss function, you're not going to get the AGI. You may optimize the particular problem you're working on, but you're not going to get the AGI. So this is, I think, is a wonderful approach if you knew exactly what your loss function should be, and it's a very complex loss function, and you knew exactly what your parameter should be. And my argument that you can only figure those out by studying the brain. Um, if you knew those things, then yeah. But if you don't know those things, you're not going to get to the, the correct loss function or the correct the parameters using this approach. Um, it's just not gonna, it's just, they're just not gonna surface out of this thing um, on their own. So that's my critique of this is like, it's great if you know those two things and therefore you can solve a lot of machine learning tasks this way, but it's not a path to AGI until you can enumerate those two uh, very complex functions, um, the function and parameter sets. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with that. And I think with neuroscience, we can come up with, you know, these building blocks and and what are the you know a lot of these details here, yeah. um, you know our research team, a large part of what we end up doing is going from theta one to theta two, um, and that might take us several weeks or months to go from theta one to theta two, and so, you know, can we automate our research team with this approach? Yeah, I, and, I, I think and so the research team, you know, that yeah. is the it's not to re replace the basics of what we're doing. Is more, you know, the intriguing thing I thought about. You know, can it replace the mechanics of I, a lot I of our data work? Like, but don't fool yourselves. That's the path to AGI. That's the path to getting better machine, you know, uh, better continuous learning or some other thing you're trying to achieve. It's it's uh, that's my critique. If you're if we're trying to like uh, you know do continuous learning on certain types of well-established problems, yeah, I think that would work. But to call it a path to AGI, I think it's it's misleading. Um, at best. I think even even Jeff Bloom uh, in his own work, like from in choosing the okay. big blocks, he he also uses some uh, neuroscience bridge. For example, the neural modulator algorithm. It's based on yeah. studying the brain as well. So I don't. Yeah, think there's a 
those are pieces, but I, I've always felt like there's, and I, I'm sticking with this, I've never, I've always felt you had to understand um, the, the complete framework of what a brain does and how it does it before you can do AGI. And, um, and there was no shortcut to, to getting to that framework uh, without studying the brain. It just seems that people weren't able to intuit what the right, what is the brain doing? They just didn't even get that basic thing correct and, and the basic work of how it works. So uh, nothing has changed my mind that that was still necessary and we're not done yet. Um, and so uh, some pieces like, oh yeah, okay, neuromodulatory, that's one of 25 pieces here or 10, 15 or whatever it is that you need to know, but it's, it's on its own is insufficient. I mean, we have neural models, now we have neural models with dendrites, we can have you know, oscillatory models, whatever, all these things are components, but until someone says that loss function is a, you know, a distributed sensory motor learning modeling system that works on reference frames, then, um, then you're just not going to get there. That's, that's my point. Um, so I, that's not yeah, so critical. This. It's just to say that don't, don't fool yourself. This is the, the, all of a sudden we're ready to get the AGI using this. I don't think that's going to happen. Yes, yeah, so I think we could replace this list of key building blocks with a neuroscience based uh, list. Yeah. Right? So we, we have tons and tons of these dozens of, of building blocks uh, you know, that we, we could put in. In fact, you know, many of these were actually originally inspired by neuroscience too. Um, yeah. But they're so short of what we know brains are actually doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, just think about that. You know, how many people so, are building sensory motor learning systems in AI? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I might want to look at the <laughs> robotics community for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could look at the robotics. Yeah, but community. they're typically not doing integrated sensory motor. They have a vision system, and then they have a robot, but they're not kind of learning together, if you will. Uh, they're kind of separated. But I, yeah, I'm sure there are people there. I just don't know how many. It's just, uh, it's just not. It's not the center of robotics. It's not the center of AI, yeah. and it's definitely, if anything, it's a super fringe um, at the moment. Uh, there's no question about that. Yeah. Um, but there, there is a goal for them to, for a, a, a robot to uh, traverse any potential terrain autonomously. Yeah, of course. But even thing. that, but that's a very specific goal, right? The goal should be, you know, and we're talking about not just you know a robot navigating. It's like a system that learns a, you know, it has to work with any sensory modality, building a model of the world that you can interact with that model, not just by moving your body, but moving your senses. Uh, you know, the whole thousand brain theory is, is, is it's, it's much more than just a robot moving around building, you know, in novel terrain. It's, it's, it's building this very complex model of the world that's a sensory motor model. Uh, many they, different they, moving parts. But they would certainly see benefit if you, you know, supplied them as a package solution to do exactly what you just said, right? I'm just saying I don't think they're, they're moving towards AGI. I, I don't think that the robotic world is, is even thinking about that. So, uh, so Tai, um, I didn't read the paper, but just hearing your thought, it seems to me he's proposing another paradigm shift that currently yes. what do is that someone proposes a data set and then everybody just rushes and try to beat that data set. And it seems to me that he's proposing that the data set is part of learning. So uh, we should also learn better data set as part of our learning algorithm. So how would that work with uh, what we have today. I mean, how would people compare uh, different approaches, algorithms, if we move away from this like benchmarking? Uh, well, of... th th there's probably, ha yeah, you're right. That I think that is what he's proposing. There's got to be some Uber benchmark, <laughs> you know, like some some end thing that is that is objective, and exactly what data you use to achieve that end objective is is irrelevant, uh, or you know, is not the issue. So maybe, you know, maybe you want to have an autonomous agent that can solve, um, you know, really complex tasks in 3D, uh, you know, you, where you can put it into any 3D environment and it can figure out how to navigate and, and learn about the environment, let's, let's just say. And then maybe in order to get there, the system can generate simple environments as a starting point and simple actions and add in more complex actions and more complex environments automatically 
uh, as a part of training it. But you're right, it, it sort of begs the question there, you know, how do you evaluate it? There has to be some bigger thing, bigger objective uh, function, right? Well, one of the things that, that's kind of, you know, driving some of the research I see as Jeff's doing is looking at animal behaviors and how to explain them, you know, in, in terms of they got to be able to do this, they got to be able to do that, they must have that capability to do that. Those are, by definition, tasks. And it would, the interesting thing to me is that, you know, I mentioned the robotics community, well, maybe they're not looking at it in that particular way. But we could be looking at a particular way where the success is, okay, you know, can it generalize? Can it, can it, can it do all these yeah. things, you know, successfully? There's, there's, a, there's a problem with taking that approach, Kevin, and, and that is when you take a task list, this is what they do with rat research all the time, right? Oh, can the animal solve this task? The problem there is that the animal uses, the, you know, our, our brains are a tiered structure. And, and you, it's hard to separate out what components are it's sort of related to intelligence and in general intelligence, which parts are related to just innate behaviors of the animal or things that are learned in a different structure in the subcortical areas. And, um, and especially when they do animal research, they're almost always focusing on things where the animal is hungry and is motivated to solve some problem for survival. And, um, and, and then you end up, you, you, you could be building a system that's, you know, how does the animal solve this particular, you know, sniff task in a rat or something, but you may not be getting it all to the core elements of what it means to be intelligent. You're just thinking, how does a rat brain in, in whole solve a problem where the rat is terribly motivated to get something to drink? And, um, and so I, I've always been careful, cautious about that. It, what you really want, you know, humans would be the ideal subject because humans, you could have them do cognitive tasks, but you can't probe human brains. Anyway, I, I think focusing on animal behavior is also wrong. You need to, it's going to get you down the wrong path. You need to have a, a solid framework of what it means to be intelligent. And then, which is what we've been doing and we've made a lot of progress on. And then you can back off from that and say, okay, if I wanted to design an animal experiment, how do I make sure that that experiment's testing that concept versus just you know animals just trying to you know get some water <laughs> it's like well there could be I, a lot I, of ways you can solve that problem yeah I, that I, kind I, of, I, uh, I didn't mean for it to be end all what i meant was that's a set of building blocks it's not the complete set of building i know blocks, but, but it, it again what i found i believe it, it leads you down the wrong path i've seen this over and over and over again i've, I've been to these research labs and all these animals are being tested and you can see they test what they can test they can't test what we're trying to get at um, which is what means to be intelligent. And so you, I, I just, I think it's misleading. It, it just takes you down the wrong path. That's my and opinion. What do we use for data if that's the case? What's that? What do we use for data to, if that's the case? We have a lot of data. We have neuroscience data. The, the problem that the super type point out is the neuroscience data we have, which are literally tens and tens of thousands of neuroscience papers are not well written for our purposes. They and so that's why it's difficult. It's difficult to sort through all the data, but I believe that we have sufficient data in in the neuroscience community. Just like I was talking about earlier, I, I was talking about these different hypotheses, and they said, "Well, what do we know about slabs?" Well, you know, there that could be distributed twenty five different papers on their different topics, and you might have to sort through them all and get learn anything. It's it's not like we don't have data. It's just very difficult to get at. And I'm yeah, guessing an example. That, yeah, it, yeah, uh, Kevin, an example. You, you know, if, if, if the experiments are not designed with the right, uh, prop, you know, with the right question in mind, it's really, really hard to take away something from their data uh, as if, and, and, you know, tie it back to our, our theories. And so many of these uh, experiments just try to, uh, you know, it, they have these like really minute questions they're asking and with no consideration as to whether it's actually involved in intelligence or not, or important for understanding intelligent function or not. Okay. And, and, okay. and so that's the problem is that in, it's not so much where do we get our data, it's like how do you get them to ask the right questions so that they design- Or, or the right we can answer. sort through it. I found over and over again, if you spend enough time at it and you look at enough papers and then occasionally contact the scientists and say, you wrote this, but did you mean that? Or what did you say about what, you, know, you didn't mention this part. What did you mean? Why did you put that in there? That you can generally get to the answers you're looking for. It just takes a lot of time. I think that's what's unique about Nementa. 
I mean, that's, I mean, you could argue, if you don't like this approach, it's fine. But I'm, I'm convinced it's the only way it's going to work, and it has been working, which is you have to stick to the neuroscience, as difficult as it is, combine it with intuition and observation and, and psychology, you know, psycho observations and so on. And, and then you can start matching these pieces up together and say, well, I know the brain has to do this. And then it, I got this neural tissue that looks like this. That's what I was doing earlier with the, with the grid cells and the oscillators. Like, where does this fit into the neural data? Um, we theoretically know that the oscillatory the interference model, I think, I've concluded it's like 99% certain that it's right. And then we say, okay, if it's right, then it has to be implemented in the, data, in the neuroscience. Where do we find it? Almost nobody does that. It's very, very few people who think about this at all. They, they might make neural models, but they're not constrained neural models. Um, so yeah, look, that's, I, I, that's, that's the premise of Numenta. That has worked so far. It is not a fast price process. I wish it was. It's not, it's not a fast process, but it has been the most effective process. And I argue we've been more progress than anybody. And it's because we've stuck to that, you know. No, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm not trying to uh, change yeah, that. I just, I just want to make sure that we don't start going down paths that I've, you know. <laughs> but I, I guess my question is for Subutai, you're presenting this, this paradigm. Do you see a, uh, a, uh, an arc in our research which can leverage what, what Jeff Kloon put together to somehow change how we're doing things, still being consistent with the DNA of, of Numenta and what Jeff just, you know, uh, outlined? Yeah, I think so. I think the, the issue is, is the following, like if we want to use these principles to actually, once you get across the hurdle and say, okay, now these have to be applied to practical problems and, um, and create actual working kind of AGI systems, there's a big, in my opinion, maybe Jeff disagrees, but uh, once you have all of these principles to the point where you have code that actually works and can solve and can demonstrate the, the principles in, in some non-trivial thing, there's a lot of engineering work uh, involved in that process. And so that's the, and, and there we might be able to use uh, approaches like this to kind of make that piece more efficient. Um, it's not sort of, it doesn't remove the work of figuring out what those principles are in detail. It's just sort of an engineering step of taking, starting from that and getting to uh, something that's actually, you know, saw, demonstrably show, showing something uh, pretty difficult uh, or showing intelligence of some sort. So and that's the, the gap where, where I think this something like this could help. So there, there were two ways I was, I was looking at the paper. One, uh, uh, and one more thing, and, and maybe, you know, what Jeff said is once we know the right set of principles, that could be, a re that could be much more efficient uh, than, than a purely, uh, you know, machine learning. The principles themselves uh, can lead to a faster way of implementation. Okay. Uh, and we saw this with, you know, some of the sparsity stuff with uh, temporal memory and, and so on. But you, but you, just to be clear, you're not seeing this as a uh, paradigm in which to generate new building blocks. It's a question of no, basically... no, 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 no. All right, uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's the right summary. I think, given what we're doing is not AGI, we're building partial solutions like we did with temporal memory. Now we're doing it with um, sparsity and convolutional neural networks. Given that we are taking one principle at a time or a couple principles at a time and applying to, to to problems that are not quite real brain problems, then this approach could be very, very helpful. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and I think that's your main point, Subutai. I think it remains to be seen when we have a, a, a full cortical model framework, um, whether this is the, how much of this approach is necessary at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know yet. I, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic that it'd be less necessary, <laughs> but we don't know yet. Okay, uh, anything else? I know we have another meeting in a couple of minutes. So. Yeah. That's good. Anyway, I thought how, it was thought provoking. It was, how, uh, how much traction has this take, has gotten or people implementing this? Um, um, so he's now at, so Jeff Kuhn used to be at Uber Labs, AI Labs. He's now at OpenAI and he's leading a research team starting to do it. So in that sense, it's gaining traction. And so he's um, it's not like it's, it's not like it's taken over other labs and people are doing this. No, I, I think it's relatively favorably thought of. Um, 
part of the problem is not many labs can do this. It it mm -hmm. needs huge amounts of computation, <laughs> yeah, uh, to do this effectively. So that that's a, that's a barrier. Um, it's I wouldn't say it, I I would say it's probably like a couple of percent, mm. or it's probably smaller than that. It, do, it does strike me again as sort of like an uber evolutionary algorithm. It's like let's let's take evolutionary algorithms and move them to the next phase. Yeah, and yeah, it's taking evolutionary them. algorithms and making them much more efficient. Yeah, yeah, do, do but I don't think. I'm sorry, do you see it influencing our current approach to continuous learning? Uh, possibly. Um, you know, I haven't thought, I haven't gone thought that far. You know, it's not, it may not be just continuous learning. It could be any, any place where we are trying to create something that's working in practice. You know, the better we can optimize the way the, the kind of the more rote uh, parts of what we're doing, the, the better. And to be fair, I don't want to diminish uh, Jeff Sklund's uh, work or proposal, but that there is already like a growing community, especially on the meta learning community who's trying to solve a similar problem. So I think Jeff's taking it beyond, he's talking about including uh, data sets as well in the, the optimization loop. But there are a lot of people who are already thinking about that for even for the past few years. Yeah, in his, yeah, I think if you look at the three pillars he had, the first one, um, it's it's uh, becoming a lot more popular. The second one is still small but reasonable, the meta learning learning algorithms. But the third one, where you generate the data in environments, almost no one is working on that right now. Yeah, it's, it's funny, but when I think about AGI and I say, oh, the, the learning environments, the world. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, put, yeah. Put an AGI on the world. There's lots of data. <laughs> the AGI can yeah, move yeah. around. It's got multiple sensory arrays. You don't right. need to create new learning environments. We got one. Well, his 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 thing might be you might the way you, the the system learns in that environment. Uh, you know, like babies learn, and you know, you're put in much. The parents create a much simpler scenario mm -hmm. in the beginning, and then you yeah. gradually kind of learn. That's yeah. the that's the kind of thing. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think we should stop there. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks. All right. I guess we we have a different call to go to for the one time. Yeah. So. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks. thanks. That was good. Yeah.